All right. Why would it do that? Okay, folks, how you doing? Yeah. Yeah. Pray the Lord Jesus Christ blesses our time, blesses the internet connectivity, blesses the quality of the sound, as well as the quality of the camera, so you guys are not distracted. Yeah, it's, it shows eight likes. I don't know what you mean that it takes away the likes. I noticed my like just went away too. Well, it says uh, shows eight likes. Or now it shows nine likes. You may, you're probably not seeing it. I see nine likes so far. Right? I don't know. Now I see 10 likes. It's going up, guys. Maybe you don't see it on your end. In Jesus' name, may he be glorified in and through us. May the Lord Jesus wash us in his blood. Lord Jesus, please forgive me. Give me the power not to just give in easily to the flesh, but to crucify my flesh, to destroy my flesh with fire from the Holy Spirit, consuming my flesh, and fill us with fruit and life from your spirit in Jesus' name. We love you, Father and Spirit. What's up, guys? All right, just wait a few more minutes. We'll begin. By the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll pray more intensely, trusting the Holy Spirit to fill me to bless you, right? If it's from the Holy Spirit, we will be blessed, we'll be anointed, we'll be filled with the life from the Spirit. Fruit from the Spirit, power from the Spirit, wisdom and knowledge and understanding from the Holy Spirit, love for the Lord Jesus Christ, passion, love for the Lord Jesus Christ, and perfect trust in Jesus Christ from that same Holy Spirit, sending us for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. Now, the likes are up to 18 now, folks, so you may not be seeing it. I'm seeing it. Thank you. Hit that like button. Keep praying. Yeah. All right, yeah, Adam Sheikha Father says, please, Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, bless the internet connectivity. Please bless this to be a smooth session. Bind up all attacks of the evil one. Surround us with a wall of fire from the Spirit and cover us with the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit, in Jesus' name. All right. I hate it, man, uh, when the internet connection is not too good. Oh, boy. Hey, Andrew, what's up, buddy? Good to see you. I know it's a little late later than usual because i've been running around trying to get my car all ready thank the lord jesus christ i took my car to be serviced it's ready to go god willing wednesday i have to jump jump in my car pray i'm going to be on a two-day journey but it may be three days because i'm going to stop on my way to see a brother in jesus christ and serve him for the sake of jesus christ i hope the connection is okay because i was noticing the connection was acting up the connection was acting up elsewhere, right? So I guess YouTube is acting up, folks. It's not something was going haywire, see? Yeah, See what I tell you? See? I hate this. Yeah, See, it's going haywire. See what I tell you? I was watching the Shepherd's Chapel, and things were messing up too. Really? Andrew Martin? People were noticing that. I thought maybe they're just paranoid because I got 25 likes so far. Right. It's probably something going on with YouTube servers, right? But anyway, we'll see. Hopefully it goes smooth. If not, oh, well, we can't do much, right? I was going to share something with you guys, uh, intense prayer requests, not just for me. I need you guys to pray hard for me. I'm starting a new chapter in my life. I'm going to a strange land by faith in Jesus Christ. By faith in Jesus, trusting the Lord Jesus is already there ahead of me, preparing a blessing for me and my daughters to bring them in Jesus' name, to bring them. Please, Lord. Okay? No. See? We're, we're messing up. Is everything good? Does it sound good? It's buffering. Everything good? Let me know before I even begin. Yeah, I think something's wrong with the YouTube servers. So we'll see. I will tell you where you're going to go, Khan, in a minute. All right? Exactly, Andrew. And this is an atheist. It's a matter of time before you start glorifying Jesus Christ. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu. Melech HaOlam, yes, we heard your Shahada clearly. Who's Shahada? What are you talking about? Talking about my Shahada? Ooh, you're crossing, Sam. What's crossing? What does that mean? Is that your name? Baruch Ata 
Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. What a long name. I believe in Jesus. I don't know what you mean speak tongues. I speak Assyrian. That's a tongue. That's a language. Okay. Connection good? I'm scared to even begin. I'm really scared. I hope so. Why do I hear myself? Is it okay? Amen. I, I come in agreement with you, Holy Tornado. The Holy Blood of Jesus Christ are covering on a wall of fire from the Holy Spirit. I'm not. I'm just waiting a few more minutes, making sure the connection is all good. Okay. Everything good? The connection good? Let's send Khan on his merry way. Can you, admins, be quick to get rid of nuisances, please? Okay. Sound is good. Connection. Okay. Good, good. I just found out something. Uh, I didn't watch the video. How are you doing, Assyrian Eagle? God bless you. I didn't watch the video, but someone brought it to my attention, and I watched David Wood's later, latest video, and I confirmed by contacting him. It turns out that David Wood has had a mole on his face for a long time. I guess you guys knew that, right, because you watched the de debate. He's got a mole on the right side of his face. And he didn't think much of it, but they did a biopsy to see if it's cancerous. Right? I didn't even notice it. But he mentioned that they did a biopsy, and they're checking to see if it's cancerous. Well, yep, 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 yep. What can I tell you? What can I tell you, folks? Pray intense prayers, fast for all your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ to the battlefield. So guys, if you really love David and you love me and you love vocab and you love the brethren for the sake of Jesus, you see we're on the front lines and we're being attacked, right? You see what that is, right? For two years I've been going through, for two years I've been going through emotional, financial, legal hell because Satan wants to take me out, right? But Jesus Christ, who is God Almighty, has been preserving me by his perfect love, and the Spirit has, has been sealing me. And now, on top of all of David's woes, you saw the video he did where his mother had cancer, his brother's wife died, baby taken away, all these issues. And now this mole that now they're testing to see if it's cancerous. Do you see how real the spirit realm is? Do you guys get an idea of how real the spirit realm is? How powerful these demons of Islam happen to be? The demon that possessed Muhammad, if not Satan himself, very powerful, wicked, hateful, murderous demon. And anyone who goes against Islam will have a horde of evil, hateful, murderous demons attacking them. But because of the Holy Spirit, who's God Almighty, sealing David, sealing me, sealing all our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, and because the blood of Jesus Christ is all-powerful against the kingdom of darkness, and the blood of Jesus covers us, no matter what they throw against us, the Holy Spirit makes sure we don't give in, but endure, remain faithful by the power of the Holy Spirit till the very end for the glory of Jesus Christ. So I was kind of shocked to hear it. Pray in Jesus' name. He gets a good report in Jesus' name. That good report is it's not cancerous. We already had our brother Nabil Qureshi leave this world at the age of 34 because of cancer, where now he is completely cancer-free, perfectly healed and whole and more alive in the presence of Jesus. So he didn't lose anything. It's the people he leaves behind that have a loss. He gained heaven. He gained Jesus, right? So now pray. You see, it's serious, guys. It's so serious that I'm leaving my state. Trusting Jesus Christ will send me to a different state <clears throat> to protect me from this evil, wicked, filthy, demonic judge and legal system, right? So, so please pray, guys. It's not a joke. When you, we study the Bible and talk about Jesus, we're not talking about fiction or make-believe or myth. We're talking about a real spirit realm. We're talking about a God who is real, who is life, who is alive, Father, Son, and Spirit, and a spirit realm that is real, that's filled with good and evil spirit creatures. 
Satan is real, right? So keep praying. Yep, the courts are on Tim, uh, Tim Hill. I know that. You choose Jesus, right? So, guys, you got to pray, right? You got to pray. You got to cover us in your prayers. You got to plead the blood of Jesus Christ to wash us, the Holy Spirit to seal us and our family and provide for us and give us the grace to endure till the end. Yep, it's very bad. I, I, I was surprised when someone notified me because I don't get to watch many of the videos out there. So I don't get to watch David Wood's videos. And so he told me, hey, uh, what's up with David's mole? So when I saw the video, I saw a mole, and I thought he's joking, you know, because you never know. But he confirmed it's a mole that he's had for years. He didn't think much of it. They did a biopsy, and now he's waiting for the results. So in Jesus' name, by the grace of Jesus, trusting for a good report, Lord Jesus. All right? That's what we're trusting. All right? I don't know. It's tiring. It really is tiring. In fact, it, I'm drained right now. So guys, say a prayer in your heart that I'll be filled with the Holy Spirit and power and life from the Spirit because it's draining, honestly. I'm drained. <laughs> I am drained of what's going around us. Right? It really is tiring. Hey, the, the picture is clear for you guys? So I'll make sure it's clear. Good. All right. Let's ask the Lord to bless. We love you, Father. We adore you. We love you. We adore you, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, we love you. We adore you. First, I ask, Father, that you please forgive us, Lord, for our shortcomings. Forgive me. Please give me the discipline from your Holy Spirit, zeal from Holy Spirit, not to succumb to the flesh easily, but to wage war against my flesh and conquer it and crucify it by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. Forgive us for our moral failures, Father. Have mercy on us. And Lord, be patient with us, Father, for the sake of the Lord Jesus. And help us to be patient with one another and to forgive one another and to be merciful to one another where I lack, Father. Help me to become more like Jesus towards my brothers and sisters. And Father, cover us with the blood of Jesus Christ. Cover everyone here with the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, even Andrew, that the blood of Jesus will cleanse him and draw him back to the feet of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, I ask that you cover my daughters with the blood of Jesus. Shield them, <clears throat> love them, and flood them in your mercy and compassion. And I'm trusting in Jesus' name, you will bring them to me sooner than later so I can raise them in the love of Jesus. Please provide for them abundantly and remind them that I love them, Father. By faith, I go to another state, trusting that you will guide me and you'll watch over me as you've been watching over me and you'll watch over them by faith because you are God and you are good and you are beautiful and you are loving by faith in Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Fill us with the Spirit. Father, grant me clarity of thought and speech. Protect me from error. Protect me from misinterpreting Scripture, twisting Scripture. <clears throat> Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. And Father, please bless the Internet connectivity to go smoothly as we glorify Jesus Christ and unpack the meat of Scripture, Father. And fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life to have the health I need to do this as long as you want me to do it for the glory of Jesus. Because we know you don't need us. We need you. And that's why we say a special prayer for David, Father, a mighty soldier, Father. Father, flood him, his wife and son, his sons. And in your infinite love, compassion, mercy, flood him in the life of your Holy Spirit. Wash them in the blood of Jesus Christ. And by the stripes of Jesus, destroy that mole and give him complete health to be with us for many years to do battle against Islam for the glory of Christ. Please, Father. Thank you for hearing us for the sake of the Lord Jesus. Thank you for, for forgiving us, Father. Forgiving us, Father, for the sake of Jesus. And please loosen my tongue to speak clearly. In Jesus' name we pray. Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. Okay, Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. Yahweh, Rapha, Yahweh, Rapha, Yahweh, Rapha, Father, Son, Spirit. Okay, we're going to go into part three. Hopefully, we'll get this up to 200 and eventually 1,000. We want more people to learn this stuff and be blessed. I'm going to continue where I left off. Now, someone was wondering, a Muslim was mocking me. You see, look, look, he can't sit still. He's, he's agitated. He's moving. The reason why is because I'm sitting in a very small chair that's super uncomfortable, right? And in Jesus' name, though I'm losing weight, I still need to lose about 50 more. And I will do it in Jesus' name by his grace, right? 
but a Muslim used that to attack me. Look at him. He can't sit still. <laughs> the jinn, the genie is just, is, is just biting him. The genie, ow. Right? <laughs> Silly, right? CP and Simon? What's CP and Simon? Who's Simon, by the way? I didn't know CP was on. I don't like to be on when other brothers are on, but oh, well, sorry, CP. Didn't mean to rain on your parade. Okay. Yeah, I, I know CP, but I don't know who Simon is. Okay, but now let's get into it. Let's discuss Jesus as the true Israel of God. We're going to find some stuff uh, that not only show that Israel is a picture of Jesus Christ because Jesus is true Israel, but you're going to see things in Scripture that are meet, and hopefully by the power of the Holy Spirit guiding the conversation, you'll be blown away. Okay. In the last session, we unpacked Isaiah 49, where we found there are two Israels, right? Two Israels. Do you remember in the last session? And again, I encourage you, make sure you go back and listen and re-listen and re-re-listen to these sessions until it becomes second nature. You understand the arguments, absorb them, and then teach others and pass them on to others for the glory of Jesus Christ. You got to learn these arguments. You got to learn these arguments, right? Right. You got to learn these arguments in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Yeah. Oh, God, Father, Spirit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you again that the New Testament teaching is that Jesus is the true Israel. The nation of Israel is a shadow, a picture of the true Israel. The nation of Israel is a picture of the true Israel to come, who is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, and thank our brother Protestant for helping me to help you. And thank the admin, Zena, and others, like first and last, for maintaining order so we don't get distracted, but focus for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay. Isaiah 5, verses 1 to 7. Read with me, guys. Read with me. Now will I will, will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. Here Isaiah is talking about Jehovah and Jehovah's vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it, you know, he fenced it to protect his vineyard, right? And gathered <clears throat> out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine. Pay attention. Vine. Vineyard. What do you find in vineyard? Vines. And built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. And it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, Judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. Jehovah is now speaking. Between me and my vineyard. What could I have been more, doing more to my vineyard? What could I could have been, Lord Jesus, loose in my tongue in the power of the Holy Spirit? I'm learning the King James English again. It's hard. What could have been done more to my vineyard, vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought, brought it brought it forth wild grapes in Jesus' name. Please, Father, we ask in Jesus' name, please loosen my tongue by the power of the Holy Spirit. Save us from the attacks of the kingdom of darkness. Rebuke the kingdom of darkness in the name of Jesus by the blood of Jesus. Right? No, it's okay. I'm a little discombobulated. I know it's because it's spiritual warfare. I sense it's spiritual warfare, which is a good thing. If the kingdom of darkness is attacking, that means we're doing something good by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Okay. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. Let me read four again. When I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Now verse five. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof and it shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof and it shall be trodden down and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor dig, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. And here's the key, verse 7. Here's the key, verse 7. For the vineyard of Jehovah of hosts, Yahovah of hosts, is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. Now understand the parable. The vineyard is Israel, right? And Israel produced wild grapes it wasn't producing righteous fruit spiritual fruit to delight god's heart so god says my vineyard has left me no choice 
my vineyard has left me no choice but to destroy it. And this is prophesying <clears throat> the first exile of the, the Jews into captivity. When I say first, the first time the temple in Jerusalem and Jerusalem were destroyed, right? The destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem when the Babylonians came and took the Israelites, specifically the Jews, into captivity. But then God in his mercy set them free and brought them back into the land. And then there was a second destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. Uh, whoever this Greek guy is, if you keep criticizing the King James, and if you keep praising the NIV, I'm going to bounce you. Okay? No one asked you to to chime in and tell me to use the NIV. You don't like the, the King James? Leave. Do not come here and make it an issue of Bible translation. And do not come here attacking the King James because King James 1611 is right. NIV is bad. Mistranslates. The King James is vastly superior to the NIV. Okay? It's a terrible translation. Okay? Terrible. Anyway, let's focus. See now, King James 1611, you're allowing yourself to be distracted by someone who thinks he's doing me a favor by telling me to read the NIV, right? <clears throat> and then I have to chime in and then rob people of time. And then they complain in the comment section. Ignore the trolls because people who listen offline when, when it's recorded get distracted. So forgive me, but this is why the admins got to be quick. Quick, do not let people distract because then I get distracted because they're distracted. We lose focus. Then I tell you that today I sense a special attack from the kingdom of darkness, but the blood of Jesus covers us and protects us. So notice the questions again. Let's change topic. Let's talk about Bible versions. Okay. Can we now focus? Can we focus now before I begin? Okay. Did I lose connection? See, I'm telling you, I'm being attacked. My, you saw what happened? I don't know if you saw it. I went blank. My screen went blank. My screen went blank. I just did. Do you guys understand the spiritual warfare is very bad tonight? Are you sensing it now? I just lost connection. My screen went blank. Yep, all of you, right? So, guys, listen to me again. We're under spiritual attack. The kingdom of darkness is real, and we're getting attacked viciously to distract us from focusing on the glory of Jesus Christ. So are you guys praying and asking the Lord Jesus to protect and rebuke these unclean spirits in Jesus' name? I'm not joking. And if they're Christians, they're going to mock me for saying this. Shame on you because you claim to believe in the Bible. Therefore, you believe in a spirit realm. And therefore, you believe in the kingdom of darkness trying to distract us. Okay? Amen. They fall at the feet of Jesus by the power of the blood of Jesus covering us. But, guys, we're being attacked spiritually. I sensed it when I came on. Okay? So help me to help you. Focus. Focus. Okay? Focus. Let's focus. Did you catch the point of Isaiah 5 verses 1 to 7? Let's try to refocus. Isaiah 5, 1, 7. The vineyard is who? According. Let's see if you guys paid attention. Isaiah 5 verses 1 to 7. The vineyard is who? The vineyard is who? Israel. You got it. Okay. So if I ask you, the vine is who? Because what do you expect to find in a vineyard? A vine. Who is the vine? Who is the vine? Israel, right? Now let's go to John 15, verses 1 to 8. John 15, verses 1 to 8. Israel, Nate. I know you want to say Judah. There it says Israel, and the people of Judah is his planting. Okay? John 15, verses 1 to 8. Now, what's the connection with Jesus Christ, our Lord? Let's see the connection. I am the true vine. And my father is the husbandman. 
the vine dresser. Did you catch it? I am the true vine. Implication. Israel is not the true vine. I am the true vine. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. Remain in union with me. Re remain in fellowship with me. Remain in love with me. Pray to me. Speak to me. Seek me. Love me. Obey me. Praise me. That's how you remain in Christ. Obeying his will. Avoiding the things he hates. Speaking to him in prayer. Singing him. Singing to him. And, and modeling your life in a manner that brings him glory. Remain in me. That's what it means. Be in fellowship with me, in union with me, in communion with me. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Notice verse 5. Pay attention to verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. You got to remain in union with me, in fellowship with me, in love with me. How do you remain in union with Christ, in fellowship with Christ? Obeying his will, praying to him, singing to him, honoring him, living the way he wants you to live, socially, politically, economically, religiously, spiritually, because Jesus Christ is the Lord of every aspect of our life. He's the Lord of your finances. He's the Lord of your bank account. He's the Lord of your job. He's the Lord of your home. He's the Lord of your clothes. He's the Lord of every part of you. Right? So he says, I am the true vine. You who claim to be Christians are branches attached to the true vine. However, I'm telling you, the branch that bears fruit, it remains attached to the true vine me. If you are a Christian, claiming to be a Christian, claiming to be connected to me, but you live lawlessly, you disobey me, and you live in a manner contrary to my will, then you'll be cut off and thrown into the fire. Let's finish it. Here. Verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. For 7 and 8. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Verse 8, herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so that ye shall be my disciples. What is Jesus' point here? Let me break it down. Guys, pay attention. Jesus' point is, prove yourselves to be my disciples. Show yourselves to be true Christians, branches that are truly united to the true vine, truly in union with me. And the way you prove it, the way you show it, is by bearing fruit. Well, how do you bear fruit? It's not about spiritual fruit. By obeying me. John 15, verses 9 to 10. John 15, verses 9 to 10. Let's read it. Yep. It's talking about people who think they're Christian, who because of their disobedience and willful, sinful lifestyle, will be cut off and thrown into hell. John 15, 9 to 10, choose Jesus, read. Here's how you know you're a true Christian. Prove yourself to be, show yourself to be a true Christian, a branch that is alive and truly attached to the vine that's bearing much spiritual fruit. How do you do it? Here, verses 9 to 10. Choose Jesus, here's your answer. As the Father have loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? How do I prove myself and to others that I'm a true Christian? How do I remain truly attached to the true vine in union with him and not a fake Christian, a so-called Christian who claims to be united to Christ? The way I show it, the way I prove it, is obeying his commands by the power of the Holy Spirit, even though I will do it imperfectly. Don't ask me a silly question about the age of grace, because at no point in time 
Has it not been the age of grace? Don't read your dispensationalism into the Bible. Please don't do that. At no point in time has it not been the age of grace. They've been saved by grace from the beginning and will be saved by grace till the very end. Okay? This age of grace. When has it not been the age of grace? A lot of bad theology out there. May the Lord Jesus save us from it. Forgive me for my frustration. Okay, now let's go back to the issue. And I hope I'm not putting you to sleep. I hope this is not boring. Okay. Jesus said he's the true vine in contrast to what? Jesus said he's the true vine in contrast to what? The true vine in contrast to what? So did you see here what he's telling you? He's telling you, I am true Israel. That doesn't mean the nation of Israel is fake. Here I need to teach you something by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oftentimes the Bible uses the term true, not in the sense that others are fake. True in contrast to that which is fake. Oftentimes the Bible uses the term true, right? In the sense of the reality of which others are simply a shadow of. You have this filthy dog who's upset that his mother gave birth to him, not knowing who his father is. Sam is a sham. Can you send him to Asheron, this dog? See, admins, you got to be fast. You see, you don't even catch this guy. Come on, admins, faster. I don't pay you nothing for nothing. Okay. We focus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, the word true is often used in the Bible. Listen, guys, I need you to... Pay attention because I want you to learn how to unpack Scripture, okay? And learn the language of Scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes, the Bible uses the term true, not in contrast to that which is fake. Oftentimes, the Bible uses the word true in, in contrast to that which is simply a shadow of the reality. You have the reality and you have the shadows of the reality. So when Jesus says he's the true vine, he's not saying Israel is fake. He's saying Israel is not the real reality, the real, real Israel. Israel is a shadow of the one who is really Israel, truly Israel in the fullest sense. I'll prove it to you. Let's go to John 1 verse 9. John 1 verse 9. John 1, verse 9. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So Jesus Christ is the true light. The true light. Who was to come into the world to illuminate everyone. He's the true light. Let's go to Matthew 5, 13. As the Lord Jesus enables me to recall scripture for his glory. Matthew 5, 13. Watch here. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost the Savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Now, we're the salt of the earth, right? Now, 14 to 16, notice what else we are. 14 to 16. You are the salt, and I need to unpack that. God willing, in Jesus' name, in time I'll unpack. What does it mean that we are salt? I can't do it right now. This is a lot of meat. That one verse has a lot of meat. I'll unpack it later. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. You, my disciples, my followers, are the light of the world. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. You don't hide a light. You let the light shine to lighten people's paths so they can find their way. You don't hide the light. You let it shine to, to guide people to the path. And you are the light that guide people to the path. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, Jesus our Lord said he's the true light. But then he said his followers who truly follow him and produce the good works, proving they truly belong to him, they are the light of the world. So here's my question. Here's my question. 
Does that mean the disciples are fake lights, false lights, because Jesus is the true light? So do you see how true light doesn't mean other lights are false? True light here means he's the source of all illumination. He's the source of spiritual light. So the light of the disciples, that's not the source. They are the moon reflecting the light of the sun, S-U-N and S-O-N. They are merely reflecting a light that is not theirs, but is Christ, the source of that light. True in the sense that he's the reality, the source, and the others are shadows and reflections of that reality. Is that making sense? Is it making sense? So you understand the word true in the Bible doesn't always mean that something other than the true is false. See, you're, you're learning, may not be as entertaining, but you're learning how to interpret scripture, how to understand the terminology of scripture. Right? Jesus is the true light, meaning he's the source of light. All spiritual illumination comes from him. Now, when I say him, I mean him in union with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, together as the one God, they are the true light, the source of all spiritual illumination, so that those who follow God, trust in God, belong to the true God, then they reflect that light of the Godhead. It's the light of the Godhead shining through them to bring others to the path of life. Clear? Is it making sense? Let's go to John 8, 12. John 8, verse 12, and John 9, 4 to 5. Exactly, King of Kings, you got it. I haven't gotten into the meat yet because this is preparatory. I'm preparing you. Excuse me. Yep. Or you can use the analogy of the sun, S-U-N, and the moon. We are the moon. He's the sun. Because the moon doesn't have any light of its own. It reflects the light of the sun. That's what we are. Okay. John 8, 12. Read with me. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me, like the disciples, shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. There you go. What light do the disciples have that they shine forth? The light of Jesus that shines in them and through them as they're united to the true vine. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But he said they were the light of the world in union with me. They are the branches attached to me, the true vine. And as they're attached to me, my light shines through them. Right? John 12, 35, 36. Now, I'm going to show you how you can use this statement of Jesus Christ being the true light to destroy Arianism and Unitarianism and prove that Jesus must be Jehovah God. Are you ready? John 12, 35, 36, and 46. John 12, 35, 36, and 46. Watch here. John 12, I don't know why you went to Acts 1, 1. Protestant, are you okay? Put down the pipe, son. John 12, 35, 36, and 12, 46. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have the light, notice what he says here. Believe in the light that you may be the children of light. Believe in me, the true light, and you will be children of light. You will have the light of life if you believe in me, the light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. Now, John 12, 46. John 12, 46. Watch here. Now, I'm going to turn it against Joe's witnesses and Unitarians who deny Jesus as God. John 12, 46. I come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. So when our Lord Jesus is said to be the true light, 
But then Jesus says the disciples are the light of the world. Does that mean they are fake lights, false lights, because Jesus is the true light? So when our Lord Jesus says he's the true vine, does that mean Israel is a fake vine? No. Now you understand the language of the Bible. When the Bible says true, it doesn't always mean in contrast to that which is false. Not true in the sense that everything else is false. True in the sense that that's the reality. Everything else is a shadow. This is the source. Everything else reflects that source or derives what they have from the source. Clear? Is it clear? Okay. Now, how can you use the statement of Jesus Christ, our Lord, being the true light as proof he must be Jehovah God? Otherwise, he's greater than the Father. Are you guys ready now for the brownie point? Even though it's not directly related to the topic, it's still relevant because it's talking about Jesus as the God-man, equal to the Father in essence, glory, power, majesty, honor, along with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. First John chapter 1, verse 5, not Genesis. And then as you put first John chapter 1, verse 5, Protestant put John 1 9 right away. John 1 9. This is the message which we have heard of him and declaring to you that God is light. Now, in the context, it's talking about God the Father. God the Father's light in him is no darkness at all. But in John 1 9, we're told Jesus Christ is the true light. Now, if the Jehovah's Witnesses, Unitarians, are right. Jesus is a creature. That means the creature is the source of light, not God the Father. That means God the Father derives his light from a creature because Jesus is the true light. And since God is light and Jesus is the true light, that means God the Father reflects the light of Jesus and derives his light from Jesus if Jesus is a creature who's not Jehovah. You see the problem? But as a Trinitarian, there is no problem. You know why? Jesus is the true light in union with the Father and the Spirit. And yet because he's the true light, he can't be a creature because only God is the source of all light. So for Jesus to be the source of all light, he has to be God, one with the Father and the Spirit. Otherwise, if he's a creature, that means John said a creature not the creator is the source of light. See how that works? Everyone with me there? So I'll make sure before I move on. Made sense, right? Exactly. Jesus is true light from true light. Exactly. The Trinity is the only doctrine that makes sense of all these passages. Right? John 1, 9. Let me repeat it again so you understand. And you guys are getting it, but let me repeat because we're preachers of petition. We need to hear something over and over again until by the grace of God's spirit, it becomes second nature. John 1, 9 says of Jesus, the Logos, he is the true light, meaning the source of all spiritual illumination. But in 1 John 1, 5, God the Father said to be light. So if Jesus is a creature, that means John said a creature is the source of light. Then where does that leave God the Father? Then God the Father must be reflecting the light which comes from a creature. And the light of the Father comes from the creature as its source. Therefore, the position that says Jesus isn't God, you have problems. But if you're a Trinitarian, no problem whatsoever. Yes, Jesus is the true light. And yes, God the Father is light. And yes, the Holy Spirit is light. And yes, only God is the source of all light, not a creature. Because Jesus is no creature. He's truly God, as is the Father and the Spirit. So together, or all three of them, I should say, they are the one God and therefore the true light. You see how it works? 
Don't ask me that, Shepherd's Ambassador, because I've already discussed this on my YouTube page in previous sessions, and I have an article on Isaiah 9-6. Stop asking questions, folks, that I've answered. Don't be lazy. Go back into the archives and listen to all my discussions on my YouTube page. Stop being lazy. And I say that in love. Okay. Now, where does it say the Holy Spirit is light? Well, now you do. And I'll yell at you again to scare you out of your complacency. Okay. We're in an army, son. This is a spiritual army. And I'm the general. Right. Shape up or ship out, soldier. All right. Anyway, I can't scream too loud. It is a spiritual army, by the way. We are in war. So we don't need any pansies and sissies. Oh, Sam, you're just too mean. I don't do the love of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, all right. This is warfare, son. Warfare, I tell you. Okay, now, let's go to Revelation 4, verse 5. That's right. Get to the general and save some time. Revelation 4, verse 5. And then we're going to go into the meat. I'm still not there showing you how... Old Testament stories and persons and events, picture Jesus Christ. I still haven't gotten to the meat. Where does it say the Holy Spirit is the light that illuminates all of us? Here you go. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire, a lamp of fire, a torch, burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, in previous sessions, I already explained what seven spirits mean. Seven Oftentimes is the number of perfection, perfect, complete. Sometimes seven means literally seven. Sometimes it's symbolic of something that's perfect and complete. Listen to my previous sessions for the details. For the sake of time, just note that seven spirits of God is a description of the one Holy Spirit, not because he's seven distinct spirit, spirits, but because seven spirits is symbolic language that highlight the perfect work of the Holy Spirit. Seven spirits is simply John's symbolic way of saying the Holy Spirit is perfect and everything he does is perfect. It's referring to the perfect work of the Holy Spirit, right? Is that clear? So before I move on. So if we understand the symbolism of seven spirits means the Holy Spirit in all his perfection, that he is perfect, complete, and everything he does is perfect. His works are perfect. Let me ask you a question. Why is the Holy Spirit appearing visibly as seven lamps of fire? Why is he appearing as seven? Because John is seeing seven lamps of fire that he knows. That is a visible appearance, a visible manifestation, a visible form of the Holy Spirit. Why seven lamps of fire and why is it before the throne? What do you use a lamp of fire for? In pre-modern technology, when they didn't have light bulbs, how would you see your way in the dark? A lamp of fire, right? A torch. Right? So when you see seven lamps of fire, you got it. You guys are getting it. Illumination, light to lighten your path in darkness. Thank you. So what does this tell us about the Holy Spirit? It is the Holy Spirit that illuminates our path. That is a light for us in the darkness to find our way out. So notice it's the Holy Spirit who gives us light. But wait, I thought God the Father is light. But wait, I thought Jesus is the true light. But wait, I thought Jesus is the light of the world. So who is it? Is it God the Father? Is it Jesus Christ the Logos, the Son? Or is it the Holy Spirit? All of the above. That's why we're Trinitarians. You get it now? Do you see why the church was forced to come up with the doctrine of the Trinity? Because of what the Bible teaches as a whole. Something is said of the Father that is said of the Son in some other place that is said of the Spirit in some other place. Right? Now, why is the Holy Spirit depicted as seven lamps of fire before the throne? 
The seven lamps of fire are before the throne. Why are these lamps before the throne? Yes, Tony, that's what it mean, means. The Holy Spirit is the perfect ultimate guide and illuminator. The perfect ultimate source of all illumination in union with the Father and the Son. But why before the throne? Because the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father from the throne. This illumination comes from the Spirit who comes from God the Father on the throne. That's why. John 15, verse 26. John 15, verse 26. The Holy Spirit is depicted as seven lamps of fire before the throne because the Holy Spirit is with the Father and he proceeds from the Father out of the throne. How do I know? John 15, 26. But when the Comfort has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify me. The illumination that we received from the Holy Spirit comes from the Holy Spirit who comes from the Father to indwell us, to empower us, to sanctify us, to preserve us, to teach us, to guide us and transform us. Do you see it? He proceeds from the Father who's on the throne, which answers another objection. Well, if the Holy Spirit is God, why is he not depicted as sitting, seated on the throne like the Father and the Son? Who told you he's not depicted? Here you go, John 15, 26. If the Father's on the throne, listen to me. If the Father's on the throne and the Spirit proceeds from the Father, that means the Holy Spirit proceeds from the throne, which means the Holy Spirit is on the throne and originates from the throne, comes out of the Father who's on the throne, so he's with the Father on the throne. Do you see it? So if any Unitarian tells you, well, if the Holy Spirit is God, why don't we see him pictured as seated on the throne? And your response is, who told you you don't see him seated on the throne? John 15, 26. Yes, he holds the seven spirits of God, meaning the Holy Spirit is under his order and control and command. That's what it means, Christian princess. Who told you the Holy Spirit is not on the throne? John 15, 26. You ask him the question. Question, is the Father on the throne? Yes. Does the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father? Yes. But if the Father is on the throne and the Spirit proceeds from the Father, isn't that proof that the Holy Spirit is proceeding from the throne? Yes. So what was your objection? What was your objection? You get it now? A final example of the word true being used, not in the sense that everything else is false, true in the sense that this is the reality, the source, and everything else is either a shadow, a copy, or depends on the source for what it is and what it has. Okay? Aaron, when I get there, I'll let you know. I guess you've not been paying attention. I haven't gotten there yet, buddy. I'm leaving Wednesday, God willing. Okay. This guy's already in the future. Why don't you go back to the future? Anyway, let's go to John 6, 30 to 33. John 6, 30 to 33. I leave Wednesday, God willing, in Jesus' name, with your prayers and your support. John 6, 30 to 33. Exactly, Susan. It's okay. Aaron's a good brother. They said, therefore, unto him, pay attention now, guys, pay attention, John 6, 30, 33. They said, therefore, unto him, Jesus, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Give us some miracle to convince us of what you say. Our fathers did eat the manna in the desert. Notice, manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Now, guys, can I ask you a question? 
Jesus said, he is the true bread that comes from the Father into the world. In contrast to the bread that God gave at the time of Moses. So does that mean the manna that they ate was fake bread? Because you see what he said? That bread they ate, the manna time Moses, that's not the true bread. I am the true bread that comes down from the Father to give life to the world. That bread they ate and they still died. Okay. Do you understand how it works now? Do you understand how it works? You guys got someone here. I can't believe the admins are dropping the ball. I'm going to have to block the admins. You got a guy here who's been mocking current alert, and you're letting him just get away. It's all right. It's okay. I don't pay you nothing for nothing. All right. But now, did you understand what Jesus said? He is the true bread, not in the sense that the manna is false. So did you learn something important today? Do not assume when the Bible says, uses the term true for something, when it says something is true, it means everything else is false. That's not how the Bible always uses the term true. Right? It's the same thing when the Bible speaks of one or only one or none. Oftentimes, the Bible will use language such as one, only, one and only, none, true, not in the sense that everything else is false or there isn't something or someone that in some sense also shares in that quality or function. Do you understand? That's not how the Bible uses that language. You get it now? Are you learning? Okay. So now my question. When Jesus says he's the true vine... Isn't he saying that Israel is not the reality? Israel is a copy and shadow of the reality. And the reality is me. I am true Israel. I am the true vine. Israel is God's vine, but it's merely a shadow, a copy. It's not the reality of these things. I am that reality. So... Let me ask you another question. If Jesus is the true Israel, can you be a true Israelite, a true Israelite in the sight of God and reject Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Let me ask it this way. If you have an ethnic Jew who rejects Jesus, but you have a Gentile who accepts Jesus in the sight of God. Who is the true Israelite? The Jew who rejects Jesus or the Gentile who accepts Jesus? Who is the true Israelite in the sight of God? Now, let me prove that to you. Are you ready now? Can I prove it to you now? Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 to 18. I'm now going to prove that to you from the words of Paul, who is an ethnic Jew in love with Jesus. Galatians 3, 15 to 18. Okay. Read with me. This is Paul, a Jew. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannuleth it or added thereto. If a man makes a covenant, you can't abrogate it. You can't add to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Pay attention. To Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So Paul is saying, when God promised to bless Abraham and his seed, the seed that God was talking about is Jesus Christ. That's the true seed of Abraham that blesses everyone. Pay attention to what Paul is saying, okay? And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. He's saying that the law of Moses cannot abrogate, cancel the covenant that God made with Abraham that in his seed all nations will be blessed. Moses' law, which comes 400 years after the covenant, cannot cancel that promise out. When God said to Abraham, in your seed all nations will be blessed, nothing that comes after it can cancel that promise out. Not even the law of Moses, right? Verse 18, 
For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So you understand what Paul is saying? When God promised Abraham that in his seed, the nations will be blessed, that was made 430 years before the law was given. The promise to bless, bless all nations wasn't given to Moses and keeping the law. The promise to bless all nations came to Abraham before there was the law of Moses. So what's his point? You understand his point? Let me explain it. His point is, don't let anyone deceive you into thinking that you are blessed by keeping the law of Moses. No, the blessing is given not by keeping the law of Moses. It comes from the seed of Abraham because God promised to bless the nations 430 years before the law was given, a promise he gave to Abraham before the law. And God said to Abraham, the nations will be blessed through your seed, not through keeping the law. You understand what Paul is saying? You understand what Paul is saying? Before I move on, or do you guys get confused? So let's look at Galatians 3.16 again. Galatians 3.16 again. So you understand this point. Galatians 3.16 again. One more time. So you can get his point. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of money, but as of one to thy seed, which is Christ. Did you catch it now? Jesus is the true Israel. Jesus is the true vine. Jesus is the true seed of Abraham. What else do you want? Is my sound good, folks? Sound is good? Okay. Then Christian Princess has a problem with her computer. Did you catch it? Jesus is Israel, Isaiah 49. Jesus is the true vine, John 15. Jesus is the seed of Abraham. What else do you need the New Testament to tell you in order for you to get the point? Israel, the nation, is not the reality. It's not the true seed. It's not the true vine. Israel is a shadow and copy of the true Israel, of the true seed, of the true vine. What's a laughing stock is the fact that you think you're human, even though a dog gave birth to you, you rabid dog. See, guys, admins, you're not fast enough. Thank you, Revelation 22. Are you catching what the New Testament says? The nation of Israel is a copy, a shadow of the true Israel, the true vine, and the true seed. Now, let's read Galatians 3, 3. Galatians 3, 26 to 29. Now, let's see what Paul says. Jesus is the seed of Abraham. Galatians 3, 26 to 29. Galatians 3, 26 to 29. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Okay? Yes, right? <clears throat> For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Pay attention. Guys, 3, 28, 29. Please read. Verse 28, 29. There's neither Jew nor Greek ethnically. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Wow. You caught it? Jesus is the seed of Abraham. So if you're a Gentile, you believe in Jesus, you are now the seed of Abraham. But if you're an ethnic Jew and you reject Jesus, you have nothing to do with Abraham. Zebzo, if you don't want to get blocked, stop. Are you catching it, everyone? Your mother truly isn't human, Chelsea Hansen. That's why you're barking. Come on, admins. Are you getting it? If Jesus is the seed of Abraham, and if you reject Jesus, 
then you can't be part of that seed. Therefore, you're not truly Israel. You're not truly a son of Abraham or a daughter of Abraham. You're not truly the vine. But if Jesus is the seed of Abraham and a Gentile believes in Jesus, a female believes in Jesus, someone who's a slave believes in Jesus, then because of your faith in Jesus, now you all become the seed of Abraham. You all become true Israel and part of the true vine. Clear? Is that clear before I move on to the next point? Yep. So you see the biblical basis for that song, Virtual Warfare. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. You are one of them, and so am I. So let's let's praise the Lord. Right? That, because that comes from the Bible. Come on, guys. Muzzle these dogs, these children of Satan. These rabid dogs. Right? Okay. Have we now established that Jesus is the true Israel, which now explains why the Bible writers would take passages about the history of Israel and apply it to Jesus? Yeah. You know why they call it replacement theology? To get an emotional reaction, to vilify people and alienate them, and get people to react emotionally against them. It's not replacement theology. It's expansionist theology. It's biblical theology. You get it? And we're not saying ethnic Jews are not saved. They're not loved. We're saying ethnic Jews can be the true seed of Abraham by believing in Jesus. Because that's what Paul said in Galatians 3.28, right? Neither Jew nor Greek. He's saying this applies to ethnic Jews and Gentiles, an ethnic Jew and someone who's a Gentile. They can be the true seed of Abraham by faith in Christ. Come on, admins, faster. Come on. I'm catching them before you do. You and me there? Okay, now let me show you something. Acts 3.25. Acts 3.25. Watch here. And now I'm going to show you some stuff that's going to be mind-blowing, hopefully. Hopefully. Hopefully it's going to be mind-blowing. Acts 3.25. Okay, read with me, guys. Read Acts 3.25. Don't ask me unrelated questions, tribulation saints. Don't ask me that. Everyone who's a part of Christ is part of the seed and part of the true vine. What makes them different or special? Don't ask me these questions. Read the verses. It applies to all believers throughout all generations until Christ returns. Acts 3.25. Stop with the dispensationist theology. Be biblical in your theology. Acts 3.25. Read. Peter speaking to the Jews. Peter speaking to the Jews. Pay attention. Okay. Ye are the children... Of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Let's post it one more time. One more time. Because I want you to catch it. Peter speaking to ethnic Jews. He's talking to ethnic Jews, right? Shortly after Jesus' bodily resurrection ascension into heaven. Ye, you Jews, ethnic Jews that I'm talking to, you are the heirs of the prophets, the children of the prophets. And of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed, notice he's he's quoting what Paul quoted. In thy seed, Abraham, in your seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Did you catch it? Peter says that God said to our father Abraham, we Jews, our ethnic father, in Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, let's read 26 to see who that seed is. 26. To see who that seed is. Twenty-six. Pay attention, folks. Look what Peter did with this promise given to Abraham. Before the rapture, Protestant. Before we leave you behind. Unto you first. Remember, Peter speaking to the same audience in verse 25, the ethnic Jews. Notice what he says to the ethnic Jews. 
unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you. And turning every one of you from his iniquities. Wait, 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 Peter. Why are you saying that the Jews are part of the kindreds of the earth whom the seed of Abraham will bless? I thought they are the seed of Abraham who blesses the world. But you're saying, no, the Jews are one of the families of the earth that will be blessed by the seed. And the seed is Jesus who blesses the kindred of Jews first and then the kindreds of the earth. You catch it? Muzzle these dogs. Do you caught it or no? Did you see what he did in Acts 3, 25 to 26? He said, God said to Abraham, in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Then in 26, he says, God sent his son Jesus first to you Jews to bless you Jews because God said Abraham's seed would bless all the families of the earth. That seed is Jesus who comes to bless you first. So the Jews are part of the families of the earth that Abraham's seed will bless. They are not the seed that blesses. They are one of the families of the earth that will be blessed by the seed, and that seed is Jesus. Are you catching it or no? Do you guys caught it or no? So then why would you, as a New Testament Christian, an evangelical Christian, go around saying, the ethnic Jews are God's chosen people who will bless the earth. When the New Testament says, no, it's not the nation. Jesus is Israel. Jesus is the true vine. He is the seed of Abraham who blesses all the families of the earth. One of those families happened to be the Jews. He is the seed that blesses the Jews and the rest of the families of the earth. Olaf, don't tell me I get it as if I need your approval. Please, don't start it. You're the one getting it. He's humble, isn't he? Oh, I got it, meaning because he got it before me, meaning he's more wise than me. The arrogance of some of these brothers. Gee, thank you, because if you didn't tell me I got it, I would have been in darkness. Thank you, Olaf. I was waiting for you, my Savior, to come and tell me you got it. Oh, see, thank you. Bruh, what's up, bruh? The arrogance of some of these people. Anyway, is that clear now? Tony, there's no confusion. Michael, I'm going to exercise a lot of patience. By blocking you and sending a merry way. I love you, Olaf. In fact, you're my favorite character in, what was that movie called? Let it snow, let it snow. Olaf. Yeah, here comes one of these rabid Jews who, because he rejects Jesus, is under God's curse. He's one of the children of the devil that Jesus spoke about until he repents. I hope you repent and become a true Jew because you're a son of Satan. All right? Everyone with me there? Frozen. Okay. Now, Tony, where's the confusion? Tony, pay attention, Acts 3, 25, 26. Pay attention. Peter's speaking to the ethnic Jews. He says, God said to Abraham, in your seed will all the families of the earth be blessed. Then in 26, he says to them, God sent his son Jesus first to you to bless you. Are you making the connection there? Who is the seed? Who is the seed that blesses? Who is the seed that blesses the families of the earth? Hold on. You wish. Who is the seed? Can you hear me? Tony, Jesus, right? Okay, now, Tony, when Peter said to the Jews, Jesus was sent to bless you first, doesn't that mean that the Jews are one of the families of the earth that Abraham's, Abraham's seed would bless? Because the prophecy says to Abraham, in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. All the families of the earth. 
So then Peter says that seed is Jesus and he blesses the Jews and the Gentiles. Doesn't that show that the Jews are one of those families of the earth, kindreds of the earth, that the seed of Abraham would bless? Do you see that, Tony? I want to make sure Tony gets it. You guys are getting it, but I want to help the brother. He's saying, okay, that doesn't tell me if you're getting it. Tony, come on, man. If Jesus blesses the kindreds of the earth in fulfillment of the promise that Abraham's seed would bless the kindreds of the earth, and Peter says, Jesus blesses you Jews, doesn't that mean the Jews are not the seed that blesses the earth, but are one of the families of the earth that Abraham's seed blesses? Everyone else, are you getting it or did I confuse anybody? Tony doesn't get it. I can't help him. I got to move on. See, you're still not getting it. How can they be blessed with the family when they are one of the families? What are you talking about, Tony? When you say with the family, that means they're not part of the families of the earth. Which part of? They are one of the families of the earth. They are within the family of the earth. One of the families of the earth. Did you not get it, Tony, when it says in Acts 3.25, in your seed, Abraham, will all the families of the earth be blessed. So when it says kindreds, families, that's simply another way of saying what? That's my buddy. The nations of the earth, right? What is a family? When I say the families of the earth, the kindreds of the earth, what am I talking about, Tony? Well, I don't want to take too much time, but I don't want to pressure you, but you got to get it. <coughs> what am I talking about? Yes, but it's not family singular. It's families because it's talking about the different what? The Assyrian family, the Egyptian family, the African family, the Russian family. Okay, thank you. So in your seed, Abraham, will all the nations of the earth be blessed. Now. Tony, now that you got it, a family is a kindred, is a nation. Okay, family, kindred, nation means the same thing. When Peter then says to the Jews, Jesus was sent to you first to bless you, doesn't that prove that the Jews are one of the nations of the earth? When it says the nations of the earth, that includes even the Jews. They are part of those nations that the seed will bless. So they are not the seed, but a nation that the seed blesses. Now, for those of you who are going to listen later, don't complain that I'm taking time because I'm helping this brother. So be patient for the sake of this brother and learn by repetition because I get people complaining. Oh, you took too much time. And I want to make sure everyone's on board. Tony, did you get it? Did you get it or no? Well, okay, it doesn't tell me. Now you're insulting my intelligence. Did you get it? Yes or no, Tony? No, okay is not the answer. Did you get it? Yes or no? So am I. Yeah. Now he's just trying to appease me. Okay, that's fine. So, but the rest of you got it, right? When it says... In thy seed, Abraham, all the kindreds of the earth will be blessed. And then Peter says, God raised up Jesus and sent him to you Jews first to bless you. Did you get that the seed that blesses the nations is Jesus? He is the seed of Abraham that blesses the nations in Acts 3, 25, 26. Did you catch that part? Okay, now, since Jesus also blesses the Jews, did you get the part that that means if he's blessing the Jews, then the Jews are not the seed that blesses people, 
the Jews are one of those nations, one of those families, one of those kindreds that need to be blessed by the seed. Did you get that second part? Did you guys get that second part? No, it's not they haven't been able to do it. They would have done it. You're not getting it. They would have been the ones to bless the nations. But Peter's saying, no, you were never meant to bless the nations. But from you comes the blessing of the nations who blesses you. In one sense, they were to be a light to the nations, but they failed. Because God already had in mind that the blessing comes from the Messiah. The nation didn't catch God by surprise when they constantly fail. God already knew they would fail. But still, nonetheless, he allowed them to fail to show them that you too, among all the nations, need salvation just as badly, if not more so, because you are not the solution. You're part of the problem, and you need the solution to the problem, which is the Messiah, of which you're simply a picture of. You, the Jews, are a picture of the true Jew. You, the nation of Israel, are a picture of the true Israel. Because you are not the solution, you're part of the problem, and you need a solution to solve your problem, and that solution is Jesus, of which you're simply a picture of. That's the point. You got it, Moab. Moab got it. Thank you, Tony. Now you got it, brother. I love you. Now you see why I was pressing you and making sure that you answer and you get it. You catch it now? This teaching of the New Testament is not only revolutionary, it's going to anger many people. It's going to anger ethnic Jews who don't believe in Jesus and those evangelicals who bend over backwards to make the, the modern state of Israel God's gift to the world when it's not. Okay? But you shouldn't care because what you want to be is honest to the Bible, honest to God. You want to be biblicists, even if evangelical churches condemn you as anti-Semite or replacement theology. Replacement theology. Don't, don't buy into that garbage, man. Okay. Thank you, Nada. Nada got it. Okay, so everyone got it there? So have you now received plenty of proof that the Old Testament and the New Testament confirm? One of the names of Jesus is Israel. One of the names of Jesus is Israel because he is the true Israel, the true vine, and the true seed of Abraham. The nation of Israel, though <clears throat> Abraham's seed, though called God's vine, they are not the reality. They are a shadow and copy pointing to the ultimate reality. Right? So now does it make sense? Is it now making sense to every one of you why the Bible writers would take passages about Israel's past and apply it to events in the life of Jesus? Were they misquoting the Bible or were they seeing a deep spiritual insight that made them realize the reason why Jesus goes down to Egypt is because he is Israel and he's experiencing things that the nation experienced. Like the nation went into Egypt, he went into Egypt. Like the nation came out of Egypt, he came out of Egypt. Like the nation went into the wilderness, he went into the wilderness. Like the nation was tempted, he was. You, you understand what's happening? Joseph was hated by his brethren, handed over to the Gentiles who persecuted him. Then he was exalted to become Lord over the land, second to Pharaoh and the Savior of the world. Jesus, hated by his brothers, handed over to the Gentiles to be persecuted, exalted by the Father to become the Lord of heaven and earth and the Savior of the world, second only to the Father. Are you seeing the picture here? Is it making sense? If it's making sense, I'm going to give you now two prophetic types, two prophetic analogies to Jesus, meaning events in the past, commands in the past that point to Jesus. Are you ready for those two and we'll be done? Why you want to touch me? You got water? Uh, vitamin C? Water? And vitamin C. You guys ready? It's in the thing. Bring me a four or five. I need it. Okay, you guys ready now? All right. Let's talk about circumcision. Before we do that, go to Colossians 2, 16 to 17. 
I'm going to give you two examples, Noah and the flood and circumcision. And Lord willing, I'll be able to do a session tomorrow, and then I'm on my way. God willing. And you got to thank my brother for allowing me to use his home to teach you because he doesn't get paid for this. Four, five. His, his Sal, your pal. Give me two more, man. No, you got to do it. Yeah. Sal, your pal. Okay, now read Colossians 2. That's enough. Colossians 2. There are too many. It's okay. You don't. Vitamin C, you don't die from vitamin C. Oh, my God. Yeah. Colossians 2, 16 to 17. I'm doing a vitamin C flush. So I don't get sick. Yeah. yeah, okay. Now, Colossians 2, 16 to 17. Let's read. <clears throat> Let no man, therefore, judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body... Is of Christ now, guys. You understand what you just read? The Sabbaths are a shadow of Christ. The holy days of Israel, the feasts of Israel, are a shadow of Christ. <clears throat> Even eating and drinking are a shadow of Christ. So, did you see that? According to what you just read, everything in the Old Testament are meant to be shadows pointing to Christ, because Christ is the body. Christ is the reality. He is the reality of what the Sabbath points to. He's the reality of what the holy days point to. He's the reality of what the sacrifice. You, you caught it, right? Olaf, I love you. You're a good brother. Sorry that I had to punish you to keep you humble. Because if after all, if I don't keep you humble, your wife won't. Just kidding. Okay. Let me show you circumcision. Write down. We're not going to quote it. Write down Genesis 17 verses 9 all the way to 14. Write down Genesis 17, verses 9 to 14. God commanded Abraham that all the male descendants and all the male servants of his house get circumcised on the eighth day. Guys, pay attention. Eighth day. We're not going to read it. Just write it down. Eighth day, right? Can you remember that? Eighth day circumcision? Now, what does circumcision point to? Let's go to Deuteronomy 10, 16. I'm going to show you circumcision on the eighth day points to Jesus Christ. You ready? You ready for this miracle to blow your mind away? Okay. <clears throat> what does physical circ circumcision point to? Deuteronomy 10, 16. Let's read. Deuteronomy 10, 16. Those two sandwiches are few. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. You see what physical circumcision points to? It points to... Regeneration, being born again, circumcising the evil from your hearts. So notice, notice, notice how that physical circumcision points to spiritual circumcision, having the evil cut off from your heart. Do you guys see it? Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And Jehovah thy God will circumcise thine heart. Pay attention. Roll in everyone else. Pay attention. Jehovah thy God will circumcise thine heart, right? You should be blocking him in the first instance, not just deleting him. Pay attention. God will circumcise your heart and the heart of thy seed to love the, the Lord, Jehovah thy God, with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. Do you guys pay attention to that? Jehovah has to perform spiritual circumcision in order for us to be able to love him perfectly, wholeheartedly, and obey him. If he doesn't perform spiritual circumcision, we will not be able to love him and obey him, right? Everyone with me there? Is that clear? Don't let the sons of Satan distract you. Just pay attention. So what does physical circumcision point to? Pay attention, everyone. Physical circumcision points to spiritual circumcision, being made a new creation spiritually, receiving a new heart spiritually, a new mind spiritually, right? Being born again. So physical circumcision, that cutting off of the foreskin, is a physical sign of the need to have the evil cut off from your heart, from your mind. Spiritually, Jeremiah 4, verse 4, because if God doesn't spiritually circumcise you, you will be incapable of loving him and obeying him the way he deserves. Jeremiah 4, 4. 
Now watch where we're going to go with this. Let's see if you're going to hang. Nope. Watch this, Tony. Watch where we're going to go with this. Notice again the command. Circumcise yourselves to Jehovah and take away the foreskins of your heart. You guys catch it? Foreskins of your heart. Ye men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench, quench because of the evil of your doings. You see what he said? Remove the foreskins of your heart. Circumcise yourselves to Jehovah. Well, obviously, this is spiritual, right? But are you seeing why physical circumcision was given on the eighth? Everything happens for a reason. Don't be distracted, folks. Okay. Everything given in the Old Testament is given for a reason to point to a greater spiritual reality. Physical circumcision points to the need of having the evil foreskin of your heart cut off, removed, being made spiritually anew, right? Are you catching it? Because if you don't get circumcised, notice what's going to happen. Acts 7.51. Acts 7.51. Watch what's going to happen here. Not to pay attention here, sister. Watch. Acts 7.51. Everyone follow along. Because everything points to Jesus. Exactly, Andrew Martin. That's what's happening to you by the grace of Jesus who loves you. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears. Notice the language again. Uncircumcised and hardened ears. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Did you catch it? If your ears and heart are uncircumcised, you are unable to obey the Holy Spirit and follow the Spirit's leading. That's why you have to have your hearts and ears circumcised spiritually. It's okay, Lee. Pay attention. Don't let Satan use them to distract you. Did you catch in Acts 751? If your hearts and ears are uncircumcised, you are incapable of following the prompting of the Spirit and obeying Him. So the Holy Spirit has to cut off the evil of your ears and hearts, spiritual circumcision. Romans 2, 26 to 29. Watch here. <clears throat> Watch, Tony. You're going to get blown away. Wait, hold on. You ain't seen nothing yet, Tony. Watch. Therefore, if the uncircumcision, meaning the Jew, the ethnic Jew, if the ethnic Jew... Keep the righteousness of, I'm sorry, my bad. Therefore, yeah, if the uncircumcision, meaning the Gentile, the Gentile who hasn't been circumcised physically, if the Gentile, uncircumcision means Gentile, keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? In other words, if you have a Gentile who's not circumcised, but he lives the moral law, Will God still condemn him because he's not physically circumcised? Or will God count him as having been circumcised physically? But now notice what he says to the Jew who is circumcised. Now you Jew who happen to be circumcised. And shall not the uncircumcision which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. So if that Gentile who isn't circumcised physically, by nature means physically, if he's morally upright and you Jew, you're circumcised physically, but you break the law. Will he not condemn you before God? Will not God say, look at that Gentile, not physically circumcised, but better than you, though you're physically circumcised. Do you see his point? So he's telling the Jew, of what advantage is it that you're physically circumcised, but you live like the devil? But now Romans 2, 28, 29. Guys, read Romans 2, 28, 29. Here's the key. For he is not a Jew. Man, Paul, what are you doing? Don't you know that ethnic Jews are going to get upset at us for quoting this? And there are certain evangelicals that if we quote your words, they're going to accuse us of being anti-Semite and replacement theologians. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. I don't care if you're a Jew physically, ethnically. That doesn't mean nothing. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. That's not true circumcision. Then what's true circumcision, Paul? What makes someone a true Jew? Romans 2.29. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit, not in the letter, according to the law of Moses, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Let's look at Romans 2.29 one more time. Catch it. Who's a true Jew and who's truly circumcised? Romans 2.29. Not in the letter, according to the law of Moses physically, exactly. Romans 2.29, read it one more time. Watch here. Watch what happens. Uh-oh. Protestant got left behind. 
But he's a Jew, which is one inwardly, spiritually, and circumcision is not of the heart. I'm sorry. And circumcision, Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue for your glory. Circumcision is of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, according to the law of Moses, physically, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Okay. Could the New Testament, could Paul, who is an ethnic Jew, be any clearer? A true Jew is one spiritually by faith in Jesus. True circumcision is done spiritually when you are born again, recreated, made spiritually alive, and united to Christ. Do you see it? Philippians 3, verse 3. I don't know what went meant. Philippians 3, verse 3. Now, how does it point to Jesus? Guys, let's pay attention. How does it point to Jesus? Okay. How does it point to Jesus? Philippians 3, 3. Yep, thank you, brother. Protestant is a gift to us, a gift to the church. For we are the circumcision. We, believers in Jesus. We are the circumcision. We, believers in Jesus. Philippians 3, 3. Which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Did you catch it? We are the true circumcision of God who are led by the Spirit, born of the Spirit, sealed by the Spirit, made alive by the Spirit, united to the Spirit, and we rejoice in Jesus Christ being our Lord. You caught it? Okay, but how does it tie in with Jesus? Jesus Christ ushered in spiritual circumcision, which is the new creation. To be spiritually circumcised is to be made a new creature where you're transformed spiritually, and eventually you'll be transformed physically to become immortal and live forever. Who ushered in spiritual circumcision? Jesus. How did Jesus do it? By his resurrection to immortality. Christ, when he was raised immortal, became the first fruits of the new creation. He became the head of the new creation, a new creation of believers who are now spiritually circumcised, transformed, and united to him, right? Colossians 2, verses 11 to 13. Colossians 2, verse 11 to 13. And I've said it, I've, I've actually thought on this in the past. Colossians 2, 11 to 13. Now watch. Connection with Jesus. In whom also, in union with Jesus Christ, by faith in Jesus Christ, you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Not physical circumcision. In putting off, pay attention, the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, a circumcision performed by Christ, ushered in by Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him, notice his death and resurrection ushers in circumcision. That's not by human hands. Risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, Hath he quickened, made alive, together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Jesus' death and resurrection ushers in the spiritual circumcision, the new creation where we're transformed and made spiritually alive. Now, Nate got it, but for the rest of you, what day was Jesus raised from the dead? In ushering in the new creation, the spiritual circumcision by his resurrection, what day was that? What day was that, Tony? You guys ain't paying attention. It was the eighth day because it was the day after the seventh. Sunday is the eighth day, the first day of a new creation. That's why Jesus wasn't raised on the Sabbath. He was raised on Sunday, which is the eighth day, which is the first day of a new creation. Let me try it again. He was raised on Sunday, which is the eighth day, the day after the Sabbath, the seventh, the first day of a new creation. Shall I re repeat it again? Sunday is the eighth day because Saturday is the seventh day. But Sunday is also the first day. Do you see God's perfect timing? He had Jesus raised on Sunday because it's the eighth day. Fulfilling circumcision, but it's also the first day of a new creation. Amelia, put down the pipe, put down the needle, sister. Monday is not the eighth day. Stop smoking, sister. 
Yes, but why the third day from his death? Because the third day from his death is the first day of a new creation, which is the eighth day, the day after the Sabbath. Sunday is the first day, DHC. Chronologically, Sunday comes after the seventh day. So symbolically, it's the eighth day. Hello, Earth Calling Orson. You guys caught it now or no? Well, we worship on Sunday to honor the fact that that's the day our Lord conquered death, sin, and Satan. You caught it? Now you see why God told Abraham, circumcise on the eighth day, not on the seventh day, not on the sixth day. Because God was already designing all of these commands, all of these instructions in anticipation of Jesus. Everything from the beginning was pointing to Jesus. Do you see everything from the beginning had Jesus in view? God was already designing everything to point to Jesus in anticipation of Jesus. Are you seeing it or no? <clears throat> Is it sinking in? Because I got to go to my final example and I'm done. Sinking in? No. Sunday is not the true Sabbath. Any day and every day in Jesus Christ is the Sabbath. Any day and every day is the Sabbath. That's why Paul in Romans 14 says, a person considers all days alike, but another person considers one day more sacred than the rest. To each his own. You are free in Christ. The only reason why Paul could say that is because he understood that the real Sabbath is not Israel's Sabbath, but the God's Sabbath day, which started after creation and continues to the end of the age. So today is God's Sabbath day. When tomorrow comes, it will be God's Sabbath day because God's Sabbath day started when creation was finished and continues every day till the return of Christ at the end of the age. That means the day you believe in Christ, you now enter his rest. So you are in his Sabbath every day, in his Sabbath every day. That's Hebrews 4 verses 1 to 11. But coming back to the issue, coming back to the issue, everyone caught circumcision, right? Everyone caught circumcision, how Jesus fulfilled it? How does Noah's flood point to Jesus? How does Noah's flood point to Jesus? I have a session on this. Michael, if you go and back into my YouTube sessions, my videos, I've been doing this for last two years. There is one talk I did on the Sabbath and showing what the true Sabbath of the believer is. I already, I already went in that in depth. Okay, now let me show you how Noah's flood points to Jesus. Are you ready? Are you ready to see how Noah's flood points to Jesus? Genesis 6 verse 14. Genesis 6 verse 14. Hit the like button. Go watch the videos. I have two years of videos of sessions on my YouTube page where I go in-depth on these issues. Genesis 6 verse 14. Okay, guys, pay attention now. Pay attention. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Pay attention to the word wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark shall and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. Okay, if you have your Bible, you like to underline or mark it, I want you to underline mark wood. Pitch it and pitch. Pitch it and pitch, okay? I'm going to give you now the blue letter Bible.org or .com. Either one works, okay? Here you go. Click on it because I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something. Okay, here you go. Click on that. When you click on it, click on the, the box where it says tools. When you click on tools, it open up the concordance for you. So you see with your own eyes and don't believe me, okay? Okay. Do you see the word wood? Okay. If you see the word wood, 
Let me know. First, let me see if you see it. Okay, click on it. Do you see the Hebrew word for wood? Let's see how it's pronounced. Okay, did you hear that? Did you hear it? Okay, let me play it again. Okay, did you hear the, the pronunciation of the word? Because I played it. I don't know if you can hear it through my headset. Could you hear it or no? Okay, you didn't hear it? Okay, hold on. Sorry. See, that's why. Let me take it off then. You don't need this then. All right, hold on. Okay, sorry about that. Strong's H6086. Eights. Eights. Okay. Now you heard it, right? Okay, you heard it. All right, eights. Okay. Now, when you click on, I gave you the link. I want you to see where this word for wood is used. Eights. Okay. Did I give it to you? Hold on. Let me give it to you. Okay. Now, I want you to see this word is used in Genesis 22, verses 3 and 6. Genesis 22, verses 3 and 6. Scroll down. You're going to see that it shows you every occurrence of this word. And if you scroll down, you're going to see it's used in Genesis 22, verse 3 and 6. It's also used in verse 7. Also 9. Beautiful. So Genesis 22, verse 3, verse 6, and verse 9. It's it's there, right? Do you see it? Does everyone see it there? Okay, do you see that the word is used there before I move on? Yeah. Hold on a second. I got to do something here. Okay, do you see the first connection? This is the same word used... Same word used for the wood that Abraham <clears throat> was going to place Isaac on in order to offer him as a burnt offering. This same word is used in Genesis 22, where Isaac carried the wood upon which he would be offered as a burnt offering. So notice the connection with sacrifice. Wood used for burnt offering of Isaac, who's a picture of Christ. You catch that? You catch that? You catch it before I move on. I'm going slow with this. Now go back again. That's the first connection. Go back again to the main page. What is the word for pitch, shall pitch? Do you see? It's kafar. 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 Let me give you the, the link. Kafar. Here you go. The word shall pitch. Okay. Kafar. Strong's age 3722. Kafar. Kafar. He wants to pronounce it kafar. That's fine. Kafar, tomato, tomato. Kafar. Do you see it? Do you guys see that? Do you see that word shall pitch? Before I move on, I'm going slow. I hope I'm not boring you. No, it's not kafir. Well, yeah, you know what? It is the, the Hebrew cognate of kafir. But don't get into Arabic here. Kafar or kafir. That's the word make atonement. That's the word used in Leviticus 16 for the day of atonement. That's the word used in Leviticus 17.11. Let's look at Leviticus 17.11. Shall pitch it, the word pitch it, shall pitch it, is kafar or kafir where we get the word make atonement. Leviticus 17, 11, where we get the word make atonement. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. Folks, guess what the word is? It's the same word. It's the same word. Is it a coincidence that the word used to cover the ark, the wood? The wood is covered. It says, you shall pitch it, pitch it, right, with pitch. The words used for pitch is the word where we get atonement and a price for the life to ransom a life. The words used for pitching the wood with pitch are the words used 
for atonement and offering a ransom, the ransom price to save a life. You don't believe me? Here you go. Go back to the word again. The second occurrence of pitch it. The second occurrence. Go there. Here's the link again. Where it says pitch it with pitch. The second occurrence. Here it is. Strong's 8, 37, 24. Kofir. Kofir. Kofir or Kofir. Okay. That's the second occurrence. The word means the price of a life ransom. The price of a life ransom. Okay. Folks, pay attention. Pay attention. The word used for the wood to make the ark is the very same word used in Genesis 22, verses 3, 6 to 7 and 9, to refer to the wood that Isaac carried, upon which he would be burnt, offered as a burnt offering as a sacrifice, number one. When it says, shall pitch it, the word shall pitch it is the word kafar or kafer, like he pronounced it, which is the word to make atonement. And it's used in Leviticus 17, 11, that I've given you the blood to make atonement for your souls. And the second occurrence where it says you shall pitch it with pitch, the word pitch is kofer, and that is the word used for the ransom given, the price to ransom a life, to save a life. Wait, that means the ark being pitched becomes a picture of the cross upon which Jesus made atonement to save us from the flood of God's wrath. The cross is the wood which was pitched with the pitch of the blood of Christ to save us from the flood of God's wrath. I'm going to let it sink in. Notice, it's not just they entered the ark made of that wood. The wood had to be pitched with a pitch. Is it a coincidence that the words used to pitch with a pitch are the words used for make atonement and price of a life, the ransom you pay to save a life from death? Those two words used, that's what's covering the wood in order to save them in the wood from the flood of God's destruction. So how does it tie with Jesus? The wood. Jesus is nailed on the wood. And he is the pitch. It was pitched with the blood of Christ, the wood of Christ, was pitched with the pitch of his blood to save us from the flood of God's wrath. I'm remaining silent because I want it to sink in. Now convince me the Bible is not supernatural. It's not divine. It's not truly the word of God. Convince me the God of Bible is not real. He's not alive. Convince me that Jesus isn't the God man. And convince me that the entire Old Testament is not about Jesus. Convince me. Convince me. Amazing, isn't it? If after this, honestly... You still turn away from Jesus, deny Jesus, and ignore Jesus, then honestly, you deserve the flood of God's wrath. Honestly. What more do you want God to do besides showing up in the flesh before your eyes? But even if he shows up in the flesh before your eyes, you'll still explain it away as a hallucination, like many do. Okay. Now, clear to everyone, right? I hope I was able to refute that guy, Lee Baker, whom James White did a very poor, inadequate, shameful job of refuting 
in regards to his arguments from the Hebrew Scriptures. Go back, listen to these three parts, re-listen to it, send it to others, take down the information, study it, understand it by the power of the Spirit, and use it to bless others for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay? Subscribe to my channel. Go back and listen to all these sessions. I've done two years of sessions. Listen, there's meat in it. And keep praying for me, God willing. I get everything organized, ready to ship and sail Wednesday. I got... Two days of driving, pray for traveling mercies, pray for protection, pray for anointing, pray for miraculous protection of my daughters, that God will do a miracle and bring them to me sooner than later. Continue to pro provide financially as I start a new chapter in my life in a new land, in a strange land, going by faith in Jesus, knowing he will preserve me. Pray I become holier, more like Jesus, and crucify my flesh. Pray I get healthier. And pray for the provisions to come in and pray for more wisdom and knowledge to bless you. As long as God wants me to bless you and teach you, and as long as he gives me help to do so, I will serve you till Jesus takes me home until I die. All right? I'm off to another state. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, we love you. Pray for me, all right? And my angels. Pray God saves me miraculously from this corrupt judicial system. Charlie, book me a ticket, fly me out to Australia to teach, and I'll come. I'm in full-time ministry, man. At the very least you can do is get me a ticket. Come on, you stingy, cheap, beautiful Christian you. Love you guys. I hope you're blown away, by the way. I hope you're amazed again at the depth and beauty of God's word. Amen, Andrew, because you're speaking as a Christian, and by faith in Jesus' name, they'll be with me. Because you are a Christian, Andrew. Even you know it. I love you, Andrew. I love every one of you, for Christ's sake. 